So hello, hello to everybody. Welcome to all of you, uh, dear colleagues, friends, and uh, visitors of uh, the conference on well-being 2022. I, I'm, I'm Serge Allegretza. I'm the Director General of STATEC, which is the Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies. And uh, my colleagues from STATEC Research had this uh, very good idea to organize uh, this conference on well-being because we think that uh, we did some some good work in this field and uh, i think i thought that it would be a very good idea to to gather here to to discuss uh, some of the of, of the progress and results of of research and i hope that uh, we will have uh, a lot of uh, interesting discussion this afternoon uh, we start uh, officially it's a launch of this uh, of, of the conference and i have the pleasure and the honor to present uh, i think an author which uh, many of you uh, know already it's john de graf sitting here on my right um, john de graf is an american author journalist filmmaker a member of numerous non-profit organizations, co-founder of both Take Back Your Time and the Happiness Alliance. And in his talk, he will share his perspective on how society can move towards a happier, healthier, and more sustainable quality of life. That's a huge program, so I hand it over to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, to be among thinkers that I so respect. I want to thank uh, Chiara and Francesco and Frances. Can you hear me? Okay. And Francesco and Kelsey, uh, especially, also for inviting me here and making this possible. I, I have a little simpler bio that I sometimes give of myself because it gives you a little better sense, I think, of who I am. It goes like this. John DeGraff regrets that to the eternal disappointment of his mother, he left college before graduation to become a community organizer. In penance, he vowed to live simply, a decision reinforced by his profession as a documentary filmmaker. I think that kind of sums up a little bit my life. So let me start. Uh, this is going to be a bit different talk, not an academic talk. Uh, I think more storytelling, and I hope that you will be with me. I know with some sadness that my message may have more resonance here than it would in my home country, the United States. Much that I see in Europe, and I've been here for two weeks before the conference, seems far superior to what I see at home. In America, even before COVID-19, I walked daily past the tents of the homeless, the outstretched hands of beggars with their thin dogs and downcast eyes, the pitiful attic screaming on the corners and the streets made ugly by, by garbage. And I am always careful to listen for the sound of gunfire. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about gunfire in the United States uh, recently. Yeah, this is in my home city of Seattle. In Europe, too, you have seen tragedies associated with COVID, and you have now seen war and death at your very doorstep in ways Europe has not seen since the Second World War. So it seems almost callous to talk about well-being while so many are suffering, and yet we must, because it is our current neglect of the true sources of well-being and our distorted notions and measurements of success that in part have led to our current crises. I think that even in this dark time, there are important reasons for hope. Some time ago, I was both surprised and delighted to see the prime ministers, both female, of Iceland and Scotland declare that we need new measures to address the weaknesses of GDP. I was even more surprised to see another young woman, the prime minister of Finland, the world's happiest country, according to the World Happiness Report, again, by the way, suggests that we might all be better off if we work 24 hours a week instead of 40. I think they get it, this well-being thing, if only I could say the same for the leaders of my own country. 
This evening, I want to talk about two important elements of well being that I feel have been too often neglected in our conversations. The first element, time use or time balance, is one of Bhutan's domains of happiness. And it does seem to be a common element in European well being surveys as well, however ignored it's been in my own country. You say you work to live while we Americans live to work. And we are the sorrier for it. But the second ele element is beauty, both natural and human design. It's something whose value you and we in America often recognize Im implicitly, yet it is not included in any of the well being or happiness surveys I'm familiar with. Ah, let me change the slide here. Uh, there we go. There we go. Just get it. The Happiness Alliance, with which I've been associated for a decade, offers an excellent survey based on domains developed by Bhutan. I re recommend that you join the 100,000 people who have already taken that survey. But it does not include beauty. Neither does Bhutan's, perhaps because in beauty, in Bhutan, beauty is expected from the landscape of the Himalayan peaks to the art that adorns most homes and offices. Slide. Francis and Claire of Assisi have been called the most popular of saints. They're my favorites too, and I wanna tell you why. Neither, nearly 50 years ago, I first saw Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, the late Franco Zeffirelli's film about the life of St. Francis. Some of you may have seen it. In many respects, it was a typical movie, straightforward, pretty, every scene shot at the golden hour. As a filmmaker myself, I recognize things like that. Nonetheless, the film contained a radical message. It portrayed Francis as a Christian rebel against the growing materialism of his day. In the film, Francis challenges his father, a very rich textile merchant whose wealth comes from the exploitation of his workers and whose life round, uh, revolves around calculations of economic profit. What's it all for, this business, this busyness that so consumes my father, Francis asked. Instead, he and his friend Claire called their peers to savor the wonder of creation and to care for it. Francis reminded them of Christ's words about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air who neither sow nor reap and yet are more beautiful than Solomon was in all his glory. Francis warned them that they could not serve both God and money. It will only make you miserable, he says in the film. And he asked them to take the time to discover what really matters. He asked them to slow down and be here now. The music in the movie was performed by the folk singer Donovan, and it was too simple for most people's taste, in a way including mine. But the words to one of the songs has stayed with me over all these years, it goes like this. If you want your dream to grow, take your time, go slowly. Do few things, but do them well. Simple gifts are holy. We live in a very different world with very different ideas from those Francis was about. Our dream is a different dream. If Donovan wanted to write a song expressing our temporal values, it might go something like this. If you want your dream to grow, work all day, go faster. Do a lot, then do some more. Work must be your master. These days, it's not remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's remember the smartphone and keep it handy. Okay. In his book, Stolen Focus, Johann Hari provides convincing evidence that our addictive te technologies our long work hours and other sources of stress in our wealthy societies are seriously damaging our attention spans and that our passion for endless growth is the root of these pathologies. The news is not all bad. It seems that in part because of COVID, 
businesses are beginning to learn that people don't need to work all the time and that a four day work week means greater life satisfaction without economic loss to business. Certainly that too is a reason for optimism. In the fourth chapters of both Matthew and Luke, when Jesus is tempted by the devil in the desert to prove his power by turning stone into bread, he responds by saying that we don't live by bread alone. And of course, we certainly don't, not those of us who live in the world's rich nations. Yet if we think of bread in a different way, as a symbol of material possessions, then we are awash in breads of every variety, plastic bread and metal bread, bread of every shape and size. So it is in our consumer society. But if we think, on the other hand, of things of the spirit, of relationships, of love, of family, of healthy bodies and minds, of creation stewardship, of joy, of being rather than having, then I would contend that we are growing hungrier every day. We hunger especially for that which the spirit requires most, free time and beauty. What's that? Oh, I supposed to go there? Sorry about that. <laughs> you learn something every day. I am very technologically challenged. Um, <laughs> maybe that's my excuse for the things that I'm, I'm saying here. <laughs> That other Francis, the current Pope, would agree. Among his 10 tips for a happy life, Pope Francis mentioned a healthy sense of leisure and respect for the environment. He has consistently condemned the modern cult of busyness and productivity. And he argued in Laudato Si that if we did not appreciate the beauty of the world and approach it with a sense of reverence and wonder, we would allow the utilitarian destruction of the environment in the pursuit of economic wealth. You know, we're rather obsessed with the economy these days with growth and money and all it will buy, but undifferentiated economic growth is not only ultimately unsustainable, and I'll talk more about that later, it also isn't delivering happiness. As a boy growing up in San Francisco, California, the city named for St. Francis, I spent part of each summer in the wilderness and it taught me lessons about the environment, about joy, about the need for time and beauty. Anybody here like to backpack? Do I see any hands? Maybe some of you have done it at times. Okay, that's working, good. Making progress. <laughs> when I was in high school, I spent several, week, several weeks each summer rambling through the Sierra Nevada mountains of California with a couple of my friends. My dad had taught us how, and our parents trusted us to backpack on our own from the age of 14. We walked from trailhead to trailhead, then hitchhiked to small towns to resupply our food. I think few parents would allow their children to do that now, but ours did, and for that, I will be forever grateful. We spent one night on top of this peak, the highest in the continental United States. Those were our summer experiences, but it was in a different time of the year that I fully recognized how beautiful the world is and how the experience of beauty and awe and wonder can shape our entire lives. This happened 60 years ago. While we backpacked mainly in summer, occasionally we went during colder times of the year. So at Thanksgiving break in late November 1962, two of my friends and I were planning a wintry adventure in the desolation wilderness near Lake Tahoe, California. There was a problem though in my case. I'd been fighting a very painful sinus infection for several weeks with constant headaches. Excuse me a moment. It was a virus and therefore unresponsive to antibiotics. I really didn't feel up to the trip physically. And of course my mother warned me not to go suggesting that my illness might well turn into pneumonia. Okay, but word was there was little snow in the mountains that fall and that snowshoes would not even be necessary for the hike to Lake of the Woods and the planned climb of Pyramid Peak, the highest in the area. The weather outlook was for the four day weekend was excellent. So I went, we camped at the edge of the wilderness the first night. And as we'd heard, there was very little snow to cross and hiking the next day on the trail to Lake of the Woods was easy. 
The distance was short and by late morning, we had set up camp on the shore of the frozen lake and were ready to climb pyramid. I was out of shape from my illness and quickly fell behind my fellow hikers. As we neared the top of the 3000 meter peak, the wind was fierce and bitter. I was gasping for breath and my head still throbbed with pain. We spent only a short time on the summit and then headed back to camp the way we had come. By then I was exhausted and struggling to keep up. My headache grew worse and I remembered my mother's warnings. When we got back to camp, my friends let me crawl into my sleeping bag while they prepared hot soup and cups of tea. Soon it was dark and despite my sinus pain, I quickly fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up suddenly and grabbed for my glasses. I saw immediately that the sky was perfectly clear with a canopy of stars shining overhead. The entire area was bathed in starlight. It was also perfectly still without a breath of wind and the temperature was probably not much below freezing. It took a moment, but I suddenly noticed something else. My head no longer hurt. After several months of constant pain, I felt absolutely none. I couldn't quite believe it, but a peace and calm had fallen over me that I had never experienced before, nor ever have since. I got up and walked over to a rocky point on the lake shore. I stared quietly across the lake, still and frozen, to the dark ridge of Pyramid Peak beyond and the Milky Way overhead. It was the most profound spiritual experience of my life. And though I am not formally religious, it left me feeling that there was a purpose to the universe and to my life, and that things would turn out well if I placed my trust in providence. Like my sickness, other trials would pass, and I was going to be all right. I remember grateful tears of joy streaming down my face as I looked out at this beautiful, calm, and perfect silent night around me. I will never forget that night, and I know that it has shaped my life in ways that I will probably never understand. Surely, it taught me that the best things in life are not things. Okay. <laughs> I can't see very well. <laughs> my friends and I walked in beauty as the Navajo Indians say. Beauty above us in the wide crystal sky, beauty below in the fields of colorful wildflowers, beauty before us in mountains, lakes, and waterfalls, in the grand thunderheads and the cleansing rain, beauty in the deer that wandered by at dawn and dusk, in the flash of trout on still water, in the dew on the morning meadows, and in the ever-present song of the white-crowned sparrow. I learned most of the lessons that have shaped who I am from those experiences. When you backpack, you find out what's essential to carry and what isn't. And I taught my son those lessons. My son with me going backpacking some time ago. You must find the balance between the pain caused by too little food, water, or protection from the elements and the extra weight on your back that can make you miserable. You learn that you don't need a lot to be happy. Friendship, healthy exercise, fresh air, freedom of movement, leisure time, and above all, beautiful surroundings. One look at me makes clear that I didn't learn some of the lessons well enough, didn't discipline myself enough, and in later years, didn't find enough balance between time in chairs and time on the trails. And over the years, I've come to think of the world's rich nations as backpackers who also didn't learn its lessons. Some of our citizens truly need more. But as a whole, we are weighed down with things like a backpacker with too big a load. Let me see. I think I'm supposed to go to one more slide. Oh, that's already there. <laughs> Sorry about this. Like I said, I'm technologically challenged. Um, some of our citizens truly need more, but as a whole, we are weighed down with things like a backpacker with too big a load who has fallen over backwards and struggles like an upside down beetle or a turtle to get right side up. The straps are cutting into our shoulders and we are angry and we are blaming everything, immigrants, Muslims, Jews, gays, minorities, regulations, taxes, instead of the misguided values and priorities 
that have left us where we are. We are sacrificing both time for life and the beauty of the world in our constant drive for economic growth. It's time to ask how much wealth is enough. When I was growing up in the 1950s and early 1960s, I only got to the wilderness a couple of times a year. We couldn't travel much, and our GDP per capita was a fraction of what it is today. But it's clear to me that we were much happier than today's children are. We had no video games or smartphones, but we had something better. In those days, we had lots of open space right on the edge of the suburb where I lived. We were free to wander through the grassy hills as the cattle were to graze there. We found rocks to climb and ponds full of frogs and salamanders. We could hike all the way to the Pacific Ocean to wade in the tide pools, excited by all the marine life they contained. But by the time I graduated from high school, all that open space was completely covered with suburban homes. As world population grows, all the open space that remains will be coveted for development. What we save now is all we will ever save for all time, so that our children and theirs may discover some of the joys of nature that I took for granted. We need to rewild our cities and even our rural communities and encourage our digitally enslaved children, especially to experience trees and flowers and animals and open space on a regular basis to experience the wonder that beauty brings. Whoops. Wrong direction. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Studies by the Gallup Polling Organization does the polling for the, the World Happiness Poll. And the University of South Carolina have found that access to beauty, especially in nature and open space, is one of the three most important predictors, both of people's love for the communities they live in and the likelihood that they are satisfied with their lives. In place after place, they found that natural and human design beauty was even more valued than good schools, high paying jobs, or public safety. In every single city of 26 cities that Gallup studied, three things were cited by the people most attached to their communities. Social, artistic, and cultural events that brought people together, and of course we know how important social connection is. Friendly acceptance of diverse newcomers and the beauty of their surroundings. I encourage you to think about those findings as you consider new approaches to well-being. And I encourage the OECD to include a measure of beauty in its well-being surveys and its house life reports. While making my film Redefining Prosperity some years ago, I learned how the fight for beauty, the fight to save their beautiful Yuba River from power dams, brought left and right together in the small town of Nevada City, California. Uh, all right, <laughs> here we go. And I was struck by the wager of Doug Tompkins, the adventurer who founded both the North Face and Esprit clothing companies. If anything can save the world, I put my money on beauty, he said. The beauty of environmental restoration and wild nature, the beauty of cities designed with nature and favoring human locomotion over automobiles, the beauty of farms bursting with diversity, the beauty of healthy fish and wildlife, and the beauty of friendship and good conversation. The great novelist Dostoevsky in The Idiot said that beauty would save the world. Quoting Dostoevsky, the Russian poet Yevtushenko added a caveat. Ah, but who will save beauty, he asked. And yet as Fiona Reynolds of Britain's National Trust makes clear in her great book, The Fight for Beauty, our politicians ignore the word and the subject almost entirely. Beauty is not simply in the eyes of the beholder. Millennia of evolution have made us partial to harmonious and well-tended tended landscapes and pristine natural settings. Instinctively, we understand them as life-affirming and they bring joy to our hearts. By contrast, the sight of strip mines, oil spills, and garbage dumps, including the great plastic garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean, bring visceral disgust. Evolution has taught us that they are life-threatening, like gaping wounds on our own bodies. As the late American President Lyndon Johnson put it, we may not all agree about 
what is most beautiful, but we all know what ugly is. I don't know whether or not beauty will save the world, but I do know it can make us both happier and healthier, and I know it will be up to, sa up to us to save it and to create it. The Scottish-born naturalist John Muir understood that a rising material standard of living wasn't enough. Everyone needs beauty as well as bread, he proclaimed. The need for beauty may atrophy without access to it, but it never dies. In the late 1800s, Muir marveled at San Francisco's street urchins living in squalor, asked him for flowers on his return from hikes to Mount Tamalpais or the Berkeley Hills. As soon as they caught sight of my wild bouquet, they quit their pitiful attempts at amusement in the miserable, dirty streets and ran after me, begging for a flower, Muir said. Please, mister, give me a flower, mister, in a humble, begging tone, as if expecting to be refused. And when I stopped and distributed the treasures, the dirty faces fairly glowed with enthusiasm while I gazed at them and fondled them reverently as if looking at the faces of angels from heaven, beauty as well as bread. Perhaps the most famous natural, American National Park Ranger, my friend Shelton Johnson, puts it most clearly. And Shelton says this, the underserved children in America, and I would say around the world, suffer from what John Muir called beauty hunger, an innate spiritual, psychological, and physical craving for the sublime, the transcendent, that cannot be fully satisfied by any human craft or invention. Our kids hunger for something they've never tasted, a soul food that cannot be found in any city or town. By breathing deep in a forest, they can truly experience respiration. By watching the light of mountains, they can fully experience sight. By listening to the birds waking the world at dawn, they can begin to comprehend the miracle of sound. Only when they touch the earth will they feel the depth of their own nature. This is how they become human beings. This is how we save the world." End of quote. Perhaps you know what the ecologist Aldo Leopold said. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. We've done a lot of otherwise. Indeed, we are already on a collision course with the natural limits of the biosphere. We need to find a way of achieving well-being for all without constant growth. And rich countries need to curb their appetites to allow growth in countries that are truly poor. We all have our heroes, and one of mine was the famous 20th century environmentalist David Brower, who you see here, who founded Friends of the Earth. I knew Dave for the last 28 years of his life, and I visited him in the hospital a week before he died. It was clear that the end was near, but I'm a natural optimist, so I told him I hoped the next time I saw him he'd be healthy again and back to fighting the good fight. I will never forget that he looked me right in the eye and said, John, I don't think that's in the cards, but it's been a great 88 years. I think that's what we all want to be able to say when our time comes, whether we have 88 years or 40 or 100, that our lives counted for something, that we made a difference, not just a killing. David Brower died a, satisf a satisfied man, but a worried one. He used a powerful metaphor to point out the absurdity of our current faith in economic growth. He called it his sermon. He compressed the age of the earth, estimated by scientists, at some 4.6 billion years into one week. When you do this, a day represents about 50 million, 650 million years, an hour, 27 million, a minute, about 450,000 years, and a second, 7,500. On Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, the Earth congeals from cosmic gases. In the next few hours, land masses and oceans begin to form. And by Tuesday afternoon at the latest, the first tiny protocells of life emerge. In the next few days of creation, life forms become larger, more complex, and more wondrous. Before dawn on the last day, Saturday, strangely shaped creatures fill the Cambrian seas. 
around the middle of that very last day of the week, those gargantuan beasts, the great reptiles, the dinosaurs, thunder across the land and fill the sky. The dinosaurs enjoy a long run, commanding Earth's stage for about six hours until an asteroid landing in the Gulf of Mexico makes the climate too cold and ends their reign. By the evening on Saturday, mammals, furry, warm-blooded, and able to withstand a cooler world, flourish and evolve until just a few minutes before midnight on that final night of the week, Homo sapiens walks erect on two legs, learns to speak, use fire, and create increasingly complex forms of organization. Only about only about 10,000 years ago in real time, less than two seconds before midnight in our metaphor, humans develop agriculture and start building cities. At a third of a second before midnight, Buddha is born. At a quarter of a second, Christ. At a fifth of a second, Muhammad. Only a 30th of a second before midnight on the final night, we launch the Industrial Revolution. And after World War II, perhaps a hundredth of a second before midnight in this week of creation, again on the final night, the age of consumerism begins, the age of stuff, the age of what I call affluenza. In that hundredth of a second, Brower and others have pointed out, we have managed to consume far more resources than did all human beings all together in all of previous history. We have diminished our soil, fisheries, fossil fuels, forest, wildlife, and who knows what else by half. We have caused the extinction of countless species, and we have dramatically changed the climate. Think about it. Try to grasp in your mind what it means that we have done all of this in the blink of the geological eye. There are people, Brower went on to say, who believe that what we've been doing for that last one hundredth of a second can go on indefinitely. If they even consider the issue, they believe without evidence that application of new technologies will allow our continued hyper -exploit exploitation of the planet's resources. They are considered normal, reasonable, intelligent people. Indeed, they run many of our corporations and governments. But in reality, they are stark raving mad. The limits suggested by Brower and others often call forth a sense of gloom and doom, a sense that sacrifices for the sake of the biosphere will mean lives of poverty and misery for all. But the good news is that the world doesn't have to continue the same patterns of economic growth and consumerism to attain high levels of human well being and happiness. Money may not be the root of all evil, but neither is it the prime source of happiness. Poverty is not pleasant. I don't quarrel with that. But once people live with economic security and modest comfort, other things matter much more. Back. Okay, there we go. Gratefulness, altruism, forgiveness, mindfulness, health, service, tolerance, meaning, access to nature's beauty, democratic government, and above all, social connection. We will need to live more lightly on the earth, more slowly, appreciating simpler things, natural things. And we will only do this if our children live with nature around them and come to appreciate the wonder of all living things. Perhaps we cannot imagine that now because we have lost so much of the beauty of the world. We will now have to convince our fellow citizens that learning to live responsibly and in balance with nature really can mean a better, happier life. And we need to convey that message with language and examples that will touch the heart and soul as well as the head. As the, head. the good news, if you will. One example, one example of what I'm suggesting is a marvelous European Union program called Naturevation. How many of you are familiar with that? If you have heard of it, Francesco, only a few. A consortium of European universities and agencies, it gathers the best and most innovative ideas about incorporating nature and beauty into urban life for health, happiness, and sustainability. 
The website offers about a thousand great examples from dozens of cities, all contribute in some way to well being. Perhaps you already know this, but if not, check this website out. The Harvard philosopher Elaine Scarry makes a powerful case that beauty is not a distraction from justice. Instead, it makes us kinder, more generous, and more tolerant. Cultivating beauty can lead to greater sustainability. My friend Herman Noflocker, one of the designers of Vienna's marvelous transportation system, told me that when the streets are lined with trees and pedestrians walk without the noise and exhaust of traffic, they will walk much farther to get where they are going instead of getting in their cars. When public transit stations are beautified with artwork, riders will use such transport more frequently. No Flocker told me that older, beautiful cities attract visitors and improve happiness. They provide novelty and interest. They relieve stress and give us energy. He has measured this effect. He even checks cortisol levels and people in various places where they're walking. By contrast, many modern utilitarian cities are cold. Studies find such architecture enervates us, reduces our energy and our sense of well-being. Beauty slows us down to watch and even, no flocker finds with his studies, lowers our blood pressure. Beauty in the form of environmental restoration can help fight climate change. Beautis, beautiful surroundings are an antidote to consumerism. They can provide us with happiness, even if GDP is not growing. In the United States, particularly, people are fearful of rising rates of crime. And we sing that all the time. You probably see it on your TV, what's going on in the United States. Homicides have risen abruptly in our cities. But studies in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, show that beauty can reduce crime rates dramatically. When Philadelphia cleaned up garbage-strewn, graffiti-filled vacant lots and planted trees, grass, flowers, and vegetables, gun violence dropped by 29%, other crimes dropped by more than 30%, and fear and distrust among local residents dropped by 58%. I'm looking forward to the opening keynote tomorrow by my friend Stefano Bartolini, from whom I've learned much. I'm hoping his wonderful book, Manifesto for Happiness, an Italian bestseller, will soon be out in English too. And he told me yesterday it will, so that's good. In his book, he demonstrates that rapid GDP growth may be more a sign of decay than dynamism. In one chapter, he suggests widely that America is the example not to follow. Our American growth masks a breakdown of social relations and the environment and offers the false promise that yet another product will end our massive loneliness and our growing misery and make us happy. My home city, Seattle, exposes the bankruptcy of such th thinking. We are one of America's richest and fastest growing cities, propelled over the past decade by the va vast expansion of Amazon, the global giant that calls Seattle home. Yet what has this growth brought us? Levels of life satisfaction that actually peaked during the 2008 to 2010 recession in Seattle before the rise of Amazon have been falling ever since. Gentrification that is driving many long-term residents from their homes and the largest per capita of uh, homeless population in the United States we have. A rise in crime, mental illness, and drug addiction that is becoming unbearable for many a very rich upper caste of marketers and online engineers, side by side with warehouses filled with minimum wage workers who put in long hours on high speed assembly lines, making the packages for us, sometimes without bathroom breaks. Strangely, we in Seattle pride ourselves in our efforts to fight climate change. Yet our leading employer is a purveyor of instant gratification consumerism itself a leading cause of climate change. Its business model, same day delivery, prompts compulsive buying, waste, and a decline of patience while filling our streets with more vehicles and filling our doorways with more packages to be stolen. And they are. But we tolerate all of this 
And now we are told that to put people to work and list, lift others out of poverty, we must continue to grow the economy even faster. Even many of our progressive economists on the left tell us that. The worship of, of economic growth is the glue that binds left and right, who otherwise seem to have nothing in common. But GDP measures what has value on the market, not in itself. As you know, if you clean your own house, it adds nothing to GDP. If you hire a housekeeper, it does. If you walk in the woods, you are wasting your time as far as GDP is concerned. But if you pay to use the machines at a health club, you are a contributor and on and on and on. In fact, as Stefano Bartolini points out, GDP might be understood as a measure of our inefficiency in meeting real needs while it promotes the expansion of artificial needs that are often detrimental to well-being and happiness. Get close here. I'm currently producing a new, whoa. <laughs> I'm currently directing a new film about an American political figure who understood the value of beauty and the environment and warned long ago of the dangers of unfettered growth. In the 1960s, this guy, Stuart Udall, was the Secretary of the Interior under Presidents John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. During that time, he led an environmental revolution in American politics that resulted in the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts the Endangered Species Act, the Pesticide Reduction Act, controls on strip mining, limits to dam building, restrictions on automobile pollution and increased gas mileage standards for cars and trucks, support for public transportation, the Highway Beautification Act and the National Beautification Campaign, the Wilderness Act, the National Trails Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, and the establishment of dozens of new national parks and monuments. Each of these brought great increases in well-being that we now take for granted, and that one by one are being threatened by those who value money and growth above all. In 1964, Udall encouraged President Johnson to challenge the obsession with growth in Johnson's Great Society speech. These are Johnson's words, which Udall gave him some of them. I quote, your imagination, your initiative, and your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where old values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. The Great Society is a place where every child can find knowledge to enrich his mind and enlarge his talents. It is a place where leisure is a welcome chance to build and reflect not a feared cause of boredom and restlessness. It is a place where the city of man serves not only the needs of the body and the demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. It is a place where man can renew contact with nature. It is a place which honors creation for its own sake. It is a place where men are more concerned with the quality of their goals than the quantity of their goods. Today, we, we must act to prevent an ugly America. For once the battle is lost and once man can no longer walk with beauty or wonder at nature, his spirit will wither and his sustenance be wasted. And uh, yes, of course, the uh, unfortunately, the gender use in those days was different than it is today, but those were Johnson's words. 58 years later, we still don't take them seriously. Still, the values and vision are buried beneath the avalanche of growth. Perhaps the Navajo Indian term hojo best exemplified Udall's concept of beauty. As depicted in the paintings of the Navajo artist Shanto Bigay, it is a combination of beauty, harmony, balance, and right livelihood. To walk in beauty, as the Navajo say, is to know a life composed of all these things. Stuart Udall was also the first American political figure to warn about global warming. And he spoke about it in the mid 1960s before too many political people were. He advocated what he called the economics of beauty. An increasing gross national product, he wrote in 1968, has become the holy grail. And most of those economists who are its keepers have no concern for the economics of beauty. End of quote. It's time that all nations on this earth sign on to the economics 
and politics of beauty. It's time that we find ways to add beautiful, natural, and built surroundings to our well-being measures. It's time we turn back from the cliff that our current passion for growth is taking us inexorably towards, and instead, slow down a little bit to appreciate the beauty of the earth. I urge you to think about how we can do this and how it will matter to happiness and to well-being. Stuart Udall died in 2010. A few years earlier, he wrote a letter to his grandchildren. It ends like this. Go well, do well, my children. Support all endeavors that pr promise a better life for the inhabitants of our planet. Cherish sunsets, wild creations, and wild places. Have a love affair with the, the wonder and beauty of the earth. We could use such political leadership today in my country and probably in many of yours. I think we need much more research about beauty and well-being and about how to include well-being in our uh, beauty in our well-being metrics. And I, it, it's not in any of the surveys that I've really seen. All right, let me finish. Oh. Oh. <laughs> let me finish with another story. On a cold January day in 1912, thousands of workers, most of them women, and most of them immigrants from Italy and Russia, walked out of the textile mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts, striking for a small increase in wages and a decrease in their working hours. It is said that they carried a banner as they marched through Lawrence, and on it were the words, we want bread and roses too. The bread was the symbol of money. Indeed, the pay raise they demanded would have meant four more loaves of bread on their tables each week. But as poor as they were, these women knew that they could not live on bread alone. The roses, roses were the symbols of the non-material things in life that are worth so much, art and beauty and nature and love. Leisure time for families and friends and community, kindness and gratitude, more time to smell the roses. We need to value these things just as those poor women did. For decades, roses as well as bread were the demands of labor. But as the consumer society came to dominate our lives, the roses were left to wilt. It's time to water them again. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know how much time we have. Okay. Yes. Oh, is there another? Nah. I'm just thinking there was a movie. Is it on? There was a movie, Into the Light. Was that your production? Movie called what? Into the Light. I'm, I'm sorry, my ears are something. I'm not quite hearing. Yes. Moving into, that was No, no, me. no. It was just Into the Light. Into the Light? Yes. Uh, yeah, it wasn't mine. <laughs> it wasn't yours. No. <laughs> I wish, but. <laughs> I, I wondered if it was. I don't know if you know that. I don't know that film. Yeah. Is it, it was um, a lot about what you spoke about now. And I think at a conference where we met um, previously, that was one of the movies they showed. And this beauty was amazing. It was the, you saw this beauty in the, in the movie as well. Mm -hmm. That was just a remark. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? I, I got a quick one. John right here. So yeah. uh, you must have thought about the relationship between bread and roses and uh, bed and circuses or Panamessa senses. So what do you think of this? Uh, you know, it's the old uh, Latin phrase, right? And I think it was it was one of the you know, Roman emperors, bread and it, Panama et senses. Yeah. And so it must be you must have thought about the overlap between the two. And uh, Maybe you can expand. I should have, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, but I, of course, those are two different things. I think we probably have bread and circuses now. And what I think we need is bread and roses. So. 
Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was wonderful to hear you. Um, uh, I don't know, but most of us are scientists um, and uh, has uh, had a vision, have a vision of science. But I think that uh, the beauty that you talk, it's much above the science, much above the concepts, much above our um, single lives. So um, b b actually, I have some inspirations. Uh, I'm an atheist, but, I, but I'm an atheist, but I, I uh, appreciate very much the, the, the thinking of the Pope Francis. And uh, all these values are upon all of us, are upon all of our work, all what we are doing. And for that reason, it, it's for me, I think science is so important because we have to work for this future beauty that you, you mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very fascinating presentation, John, many thanks. Um, I have um, uh, first a comment. Uh, um, you're, you're speaking, you're not speaking about beauty. You're speaking about shared beauty. It's not private beauty, the one you mean. So it's another uh, aspect of uh, the main discovery of happiness studies that it is sharing that makes happiness. It's not possession. And, uh, and the second uh, is a question. How can we measure beauty in surveys? Um, it's a naive question, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 my hearing is not very good. So how can we that? measure beauty in, in question? How can it be used in, uh, in surveys uh, to measure the impact on the well-being of beauty? Well, we actually do it to some degree. Uh, there's an interesting study just actually just came out, I think, in the journal Nature, uh, done in the UK, where one thing that, that happens, that we do have a fairly universal sense. If you, what they do is they show people photographs, two photographs, and they say, which photograph is more beautiful to you? These are natural settings, or sometimes they're, uh, sometimes they're human designs and architecture and things like that they find that there's remarkable uniformity in the response. Well over 90% of people will choose the same thing in the settings. So what they did was they looked at those places, they, they sort of evaluated the places based on the responses to the photographs. And then how, I'm sure many of you have heard of Mappiness, which is a UK app that uh, on your phone. And what happens with mappiness is you have this on your phone, you get an alert, like a ping every so often. And when you get that ping, you're supposed to sort of tell how you feel then on the scale of one to 10 uh, in terms of your happiness. So this is, and mappiness is telling the people exactly where you are, you know, ge geographically where they are. And then, it, then they match up these, uh, these, uh, uh, mapping of scores with the various places. And they find that uh, there's also great uniformity and there can be uh, often, uh, it's often a difference of two points out of a scale of 10 from the sort of more scenic locations to the ones, you know, in, in a place where it would be uh, uh, ugly pr uh, problems or, or these kind of, as I mentioned, these utilitarian cities where it's all these big, tall, kind of the old Stalinist kind of architecture and stuff compared to the beautiful, beautiful old European cities and other places. You can see this in many ways, not just in the happiness scores, but also directly when they, when they take your blood <laughs> and see what your stress levels are and your cortisol levels are. There's a lot of confirming facts. So we actually have some ways to measure uh, beauty, I think, in that regard. Uh, and there's also just a commonality. If you go anywhere uh, to, I mean, these national parks, for example, that I, I mentioned, there are places that everybody understands as being beautiful. There are cities that people feel that way. I was just spent some time in Prague. I came, I was in Prague the week before last for the whole week. 
And it's just a beautiful city and everybody recognizes that. You know, they say, look at this, this place, um, it's just gorgeous. Um, likewise, Yosemite, where I, National Park, where I grew up. If I go to Yosemite today, I mean, it's filled with tourists and they are tourists from everywhere. Every race, every nationality, every country. Uh, if I go um, here, as I did in 2017, I was in Milan, I, I went to Zermatt because all the time when I was a little kid, I wanted to see the Matterhorn. You know, I mean, the Matterhorn to me was like the mountain that I, that I had to see. So with my son, we took the train and we went to Zermatt and we spent four days hiking around the Matterhorn and in that area. And we noticed that in Zermatt, where there are actually no cars, just a few electric vehicles and other things. Again, people were from everywhere. And I would venture to say that there were more Asian tourists than Euro European. So I think that there's a, a, a universality to this. And it is a sense that these places are life affirming, that, you know, uh, uh, and it's, you know, we know this about certain landscape. People do not congregate at the dump. <laughs> you know, they don't go to see oil spills. So there is a commonality in, in this. Now, it may not be perfect, but it's an, but neither is what, how we measure through the Cantrell ladder or anything else. We, we can only approach a, a, a better job. Does that answer the question, Stefano? was just a comment that you made you referring to uh, shared beauty yes absolutely and i on that i agree with you 100 percent that it's so important that's why i believe in the protection of these places that all of us can enjoy not the isolation of bits of beauty you know where the beaches are i mean we have we see this in stay in the united states i don't know what the laws are here but we see in the united states that some states along the coast the sea coast have allowed every inch of the seacoast to be privately owned. And you can't go there, you can't get on the beach. Uh, and other states, Florida, California, Oregon, for example, have made their beaches public. And it does make a huge difference. I believe in shared beauty, yes. So a question here, please. Um, um, so I, I lived in Ecuador for a little while. It's absolutely beautiful country. For many, many people there, life was really pretty hard. And, and I worry about a group of academics sitting here in, in a very wealthy country, many people from wealthy countries, um, absorbing a message that says, in essence, wealth isn't so important. Economics, development isn't so important. Now, I, I don't think that's what you mean to say, but I wonder if your message isn't a bit imbalanced in that way. I think it's intended for, so to speak, us, but there's, there's a, world, a world out there that I think we need to ask about as well. Well, I did try to make the point, but I probably didn't make it strongly enough, that we need to limit our growth in, in the rich countries, so countries who really need these things, countries like Ecuador and others can have growth. I'm not saying, I believe that, that growth is very, very important, but up to a point. We see that it increases happiness in those places, and we need to to make it possible for, for, for places like that to uh, to uh, to grow in ways that they need. But I want to point out that um, the a lot of times the push for the development of these things and stuff is not coming from the poor, and in many of these places, when you in in the United States, when you actually look at who supports environmental rules that would restrict growth and development and stuff. It's much higher among lower income people than among higher income people. And it reflects the fact that even people who are very poor understand the importance of this to their lives. I mean, again, I talk about the, the, the Navajo tribe in uh, Navajo nation in the United States, certainly among the poorest people in our country, but they are obsessed with the concept that we have to protect beauty. We have to live in balance with nature and those things. So your point is well taken, and I probably didn't emphasize this well enough because I do agree with you, but I think there's a lot of people who believe that there's this, you know, that poor people don't care about beauty. They don't care about the environment. That's simply false. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm bad. 
I think I'm probably running out of time, but. Uh, can I ask you a question also? Uh, you had your speech was I'm quite. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, your speech was quite radical in the middle about like plastic and etc. other things. Uh, and the end of the speech was more peaceful, like appreciate the beauty. But to save the nature, it requires quite radical actions. And it, I would say it also correlates to people's well-being and also the number of people. And what decreases this number, for instance, this like actually benefits the nature. Uh, what is your attitude toward, toward these um, imbalances? Um, I'm not fully sure I understand the the question is probably again because my I don't hear well enough but what can you just state that one more time for me I'm really sorry I apologize um I mean for the planet the number of people living in the planet makes a great impact in this consumerism yes well you know, I again, I, I think we it's not just economic growth that we lim need to limit. I think we need to find some ways to to certainly restrict the growth uh, mm -hmm. of population and all of those things because because it, it overwhelms the, the natural world. I mean, yes, right. exactly. So right. uh, some other means and ways. So I ask you about your opinion on this um, exactly on these ways uh, because. Like they can be very radical, just like to compare like harm of 100 people to earth or 600, 6 billion people. And you know, some things that happen to people are very negative for humans, but they are actually positive for the nature and the beauty. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And uh, of course, I don't want to see people dying out or anything like that. I think we have to find some ways to voluntarily uh, reduce population. The pressures are simply too great. Uh, if we turn everything over to people, essentially, right now, uh, if you look at it, human beings and their domestic animals are really 95 to 97% of the entire mass of mammals on Earth. There's no place left for, for the wild. Uh, and we have to set that aside. There's campaigns out there about nature needs half, for example, that we need to keep in the United States, we have a campaign 30 by 30. That is that we must preserve at least 30% of the land by 2030. Uh, and these things to me are absolutely essential. Uh, my friend, uh, Beth Allgood, who's here at the conference at her her organization, One Nature, I was very focused on this. Uh, we need to understand and uh, that other species have a right to live, to exist, and to flourish on this planet too, not just us. And I think we would find that if if we lose those species, we lose more than we also lose the beauty and wonder of the world. So. We've got to restrain our appetites in some way, both our appetites to produce more kids and our appetites to produce more stuff and consume more stuff. I, I appreciate your comment. I hope I'm answering and responding. Thank you. I wanted just to uh, welcome uh, the Minister of the Economy and uh, Cooperation, Mr. Franz Fayot, who joined us uh, just uh, minutes ago, and he must be delighted to hear that a bunch of social scientists and economists are criticizing growth and putting beauty above it, <clears throat> because uh, I think he is uh, quite sensitive to this uh, approach. Um, I, I go through the room. I think there was some more questions. We take perhaps, <clears throat> okay, that would be the last ones then, because otherwise we'll run out of time. One. The first, the lady, what, I, I noticed four. Okay, the ladies first. Oh, okay, so I wanted to give it to the, to the lady, but uh, you can go for. <laughs> um, thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, 
I appreciate your criticism of you know the downsides of um, excessive consumerism, etc. Like beauty as an antidote, but I'm curious: isn't work also a source of beauty? Like a masterful chef designing world class, you know, cuisine, food, an architect designing the best buildings. Like, don't the American <laughs> lifestyles get that right? That through hard work and challenging tasks and perseverance, there's also beauty in, in that. And work can be a meaningful source of beauty for, for some people. I was just wondering what you think about that. I don't know, my hearing is just terrible. Can, can someone up close who's, who heard better than I do just simply- Yeah, um, I can just uh, try again. Um, don't you think um, beauty can also be found in work, like uh, working a difficult job- Everywhere. Like an, yeah, like an it, architect. It, it really life. Yeah. Right. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I think beauty can be found in good work. I absolutely believe that uh, we that good work and work that is in line with promoting well-being for all and making beautiful architecture and all of those things is is uh, is pleasurable work. It's important work. I don't think people should do it a hundred hours a week, but I think it's uh, it, it's it's very important. And and work should be work. We should work less, but we should work more meaningfully. We should have jobs that are and 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 things to do that give us meaning and give us the chance to use our talents and our skills to enhance the world that we live in. Don, I actually want to ask you one question, which I heard that you mentioned. So, in your opinion really poor countries, can they still use a carbon-based energy source to develop and to grow, similar to that has been used in your wealthy countries? You mean, for instance, can they continue to use things like coal or what? I'm, I'm specifically referring to Africa because that's your cheapest source of energy. And often they will ask advice and how do we develop and it will be carbon-based energy that's used. Mm -hmm. So I've, what I heard is what you said is, can they have the same opportunities that Europe or the USA had to develop using a carbon-based energy source? Well, I don't think we can tell them not to because, uh, but on the other hand, I think we can do a better job. And here, uh, uh, Stefano's point about sharing comes in big. I think we can really start much doing a much better job of sharing the technologies that we have that can allow this transition more effectively. And, and I see that happening. I mean, I see a lot of interest in, uh, in, uh, in poor countries in solar technologies and wind and other kinds of things that will work for them as well. But I don't think we can say, you can't do this because they'll go, well, what about you? You did it too. We have to set an example not a command, I think. Good. Oh, okay. <laughs> John, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. It was personally appealing for me very much. At what do you think about the contradiction about uh, beauty and I would say over tourism, like forbidden places? Uh, I think re uh, recently I have heard a term last chance tourism, for example, people watching polar bears on a diminishing Arctic ice. And on the other hand, this such tourism is limited that, uh, by the fact that it's extremely expensive, and that's why it's available only for a small share of wealthy people. And so this all three things like makes contradiction. What do you think is the right solution? Well, that's a very good point. And of course, there are con contradictions in all of this, including in my thinking. And and you know, I, I took a, a particularly, I think, uh, overly maybe strong position on this because I want you to think about and, and to react. Not, I don't expect anybody to agree with everything I said. I just want want folks to, to think about it. Uh, but yes, um, those those animals, in a sense, probably just need to be left alone, <laughs> not become the. Uh, uh, the objects of, of a lot of uh, long distance flights to go see them. I mean, probably this is where we have to accept film and we have to accept versions of this that are less than being there because they're simply too fragile and there's too many of us. 
So, and uh, I think uh, uh, Paul Rogers, who's here, uh, will be talking about some of this. He's, Paul has been involved in ecotourism and in, in a project to really try to work with, with uh, poor countries and developing in an ecological way their tourism. I know Paul just came back from the Himalaya uh, in, in doing that. So I think we need, we need more of that. And uh, Paul's work is also combining the idea of well-being and measures and things and looking at how ecotourism both can protect these places, but also improve the, the well-being of the people who live there, who, who are also absolute participants in the process of, of developing these things. I don't know if that answers your question, but, but um, you know, there's some places I think that just have to be off limits uh, in order to protect, to protect the, the wildlife and the species, uh, uh, because we have to understand that we are only one species of, of many and that we cannot, we do not have the right to eliminate the rest for our, our own ends. Oh, let me say one more thing. And, you know, again, I, I understand that, uh, and, and, and I apologize for making such a strong statement about growth and stuff, especially with, with economists here. But what I'm, I want, you know, I guess I want to be provocative because I want, I think we need to, to address these things and come up with, with solutions that work for everybody, not, not just mine, but, but ones that solve the problem and yet still, you know, uh, uh, allow us to move forward in important ways. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Very inspiring talk, very original. <clears throat>